Okay, we'll just uh, we'll just talk about Hanukkah for for our share for today. Um, the the topic of our Dvar Torah is Hanukkah, pride of the Kohanim? Question mark. Pride of the Kohanim? Is it the pride of the Kohanim? There are so many. Th- I, I'm a Kohen, by the way. So if I disparage Kohanim, you'll understand that it is with a certain self-deprecation involved. Um, there has been so much been written about how the Kohanim are responsible for the whole miracle of Hanukkah. But it's also quite interesting to note that the history of the Hasmonean dynasty, as the, being the leaders of the Jewish people during the Second Temple period, is a short-lived history. And they basically self-destructed. Um, and we'll see that in just a minute. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't know why I forgot to put the numbering on the rest of the page. But it's the third third citation from Maseches Bava Basra. The Gemara says, "Kol man mi avdahu." Anyone who comes and says that I am from the Hasmonean dynasty, can, you can be assured that that person is a slave or is from the slave class, because essentially what happened was is that the Hasmoneans became corrupt after a while, um, and that corruption led them. To, to, uh, to intermarry and to do all of the things that were a concession to the very things that the Hasmoneans a couple of generations before were fighting against, to Hellenism and to assimilation and so forth. Um, the Gemara in Bava Basra brings a story about a young girl who was the last remnant of the Hasmoneans who was extremely beautiful. And... Um, and the ruler at the time wanted to uh, to, to, to take her and, uh, and have his way with her, and so she committed suicide. And she mm-hmm. said that before she committed suicide, she said, I am the last remnant of the Hasmoneans. Mm-hmm. And anyone else who comes along and claims to be a Hasmonean, like, uh, like Yanai did, uh, can, you can rest assured that he's not of legitimate stock. So w- w- what, what, what happened to them? And there's something else that's quite interesting. There's a lot to talk about, to be praised, to be effusive in our praise of the Chashmonayim. But there's also something interesting that we find during the Second Temple era, there's a sort of like a mixed attitude towards the Kohanim. The Kohanim are Zrizimheim. They are extremely quick to act, and they preserve the sanctity of the Temple. And much credit is due to them for being self-sacrificing and not wanting to build their own uh, physical uh, wealth, but rather to dedicate themselves to the Jewish people, to Klal Yisrael. And at the same time, there are certain comments that are found in the Mishnah in, and in the Gemara that are critical of the Kohanim. Um, the Gemara said that there's a Mishnah in Masechet Bechorot that states as follows. Kol ha, it's source number one. Kol hamumin haru'in lavobi de adam Ro'e Yisrael ne'emanim, ro'im kohanim e'nan ne'emanim. Now, in order to understand this one line from the Mishnah, you need a little bit of information about what a bechor animal, what its halachic status is. The Torah states that if, you're, if uh, your livestock gives birth to a firstborn male calf or lamb, you must give that as tribute to the temple. Who does it go to? It goes to the Kohen. It's one of the priestly gifts that every Jew is obligated to present of his, of his agriculture, both of his livestock and of his crops. You're supposed to give the first fruits to the Kohen. There's an interesting halacha having to do with the firstborn animal. If the animal is blemished, which means that it's no longer usable for the altar, then the Kohen has the right to use that animal uh, for his weekend barbecue. In other words, he does, the Kohen does not have any obligation to do anything other with the animal than just to keep it for himself and treat it as any other meat that he would serve to his family and to his friends. However, if the animal is unblemished, the only way that the Kohen may partake of that animal is to bring it to Jerusalem and have it be placed on the, uh, parts of the animal be placed on the altar, and then he can eat the remnant of the animal. So you can imagine that it's a tremendous inconvenience 
if I'm presented, if I as a Kohen am presented with a newborn calf or lamb and it's unblemished, oi, living in Beit Shemesh, I'm going to have to take the high-speed train. It's going to take me probably at least a half an hour because there's a, I hear there's a backup on the train. I'm going to have to schlep this lamb with me on the train, go all the way to Yerushalayim, go up to Har Habayit. I'm going to have to figure out, I'm going to have to shecht it, throw its entrails on the altar, sprinkle its blood, and then I have to take all the train all the way back. It's a whole, it's a whole day's malacha, right? Just to be able to, be able to eat this lamb. Whereas, if we could find a slight defect in the animal, even in its ear or in one of its toes, right, or something like that, don't have to do anything. So on that basis, the Mishnah says that kol hamumin haru'in lavo bidei adam, that any blemish that could be inflicted by human hands onto an animal, in other words, if it's a congenital defect that is not done by human hands, then that, well, it, it's not necessarily, it could still be kosher if it has a congenital defect. Let's say it has, um, you know, it's blind or it, it has uh, six finger digits instead of five. It still may be kosher, but it can't be used for the altar, right? So if it's something that's congenital, then the, there's no concern. But if it's potentially something that could have been inflicted by, by human hands, so then, Ro'e Yisrael Ne'emanim, if the animal was in the, under the care of a non-Kohen, a Yisrael, so then the Yisrael is believed to say that this happened naturally, without, without intent. You know, it was not done deliberately. The animal was grazing, and all of a sudden it slipped and fell, it broke a leg, and it no longer can be used for the altar. Right? However, Ro'im Kohanim, if, however, the person under whose care the animal was placed was a Kohen, the Kohen is not trusted independently. He has to get independent corroboration in order for us to allow the Kohen to be able to take this animal home. So that's the general statement of the Mishnah. Yes? I was just going to ask, what is Hashem's intent? Is Hashem's intent with this that the animal should go to the Kohen, or the animal should be given as a sacrifice? The intent is, is that the Israel, who's the farmer, should tithe his first fruits and present them to Hashem as a gift, as a tribute. If it can be brought as a carbon great, if not, the Kohen is a representative of the temple. The temple can't benefit from an animal uh, because it, if it's not sacrificial. So therefore, Hashem says the Kohanim get it. Uh, so the, the, the main intent, though, is to bring it as a carbon. Right. Giving it to the coin is just like a second right. best case. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. So the, the point that the mission is making is we don't trust Kohanim. Uh, we don't trust Kohanim to be on the up and up, that they're not going to inflict a blemish deliberately to save themselves a day's schlep to Yerushalayim and all of the burden of having to bring it up on the altar. Um, I don't remember what the, what the consequence is. It could be that it has to be redeemed. I don't remember, but it could, but it, or it could be that we penalize the Kohen. But the Mishnah says we don't we don't automatically give it to the to the Kohen. And and as Rashi says, the Nech Shadu Badavar because they are suspect. Yes. That's a pretty negative thing to say about people that are supposed to be holy. I would agree. Okay, the Gemara then tells yes, Shirin. Uh, did the Pidyon Abin come from that law? No, the Torah talks about a pigeon haben. Okay. Pigeon haben is something that we do uh, for donkeys and for human babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for firstborn donkeys and for firstborn babies. Yes. This concept of independent corroboration reminds me of something I was just talking to my daughter-in-law about. She's a speech therapist in Lakewood, and there are lots of from speech therapists in Lakewood, and. Just now, Jersey Care, which is the insurance that a lot of from people use, has decided that they're not going to cover speech therapy in Lakewood anymore. Mm -hmm. So all the from kids who are under Jersey Care aren't going to get it anymore. I'm leading up to something. So I said, well, be, and she said, because people are abusing the system. And I said, well, how could they abuse the system? She said, 
uh, if a speech therapist gives an assessment to a child and says that he needs speech therapy, then he, that speech therapist is doing it because they want to be able to give the speech therapy to that kid. Really what's supposed to happen is there's supposed to be independent corroboration, some outside authority is supposed to assess the child and then refer them to another speech therapist. So it's the same idea of if you're deciding for something that's going to be to your own benefit, benefit. that's exactly. not a good thing. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that yes. it's, yes. Okay. Which blemishes make the animal non-kosher from the beginning? If it's, like, say, if it's a major blemish, a, a limb is missing, if it has tuberculosis, oh. th things like that. Okay. But things that we check. Not a broken leg. Or a broken leg would not render an animal non-kosher. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Gemara, in elaborating on this story, tells us about a, a consequence of this. I'll just read it in English because of time constraints. Rabbi Tzadok had a first link. Rabbi Tzadok was one of the great sages, one of the most righteous men who ever walked the earth. He lived during the Second Temple period, um, and he had, or, or towards the end of the Second Temple, uh, and he had a firstborn, uh, firstborn animal. He set down barley for it in, a wick, in wicker baskets of peeled willow twigs. As it was eating, its lip was slit on the wicker basket. Okay, it basically split its lip. He came before Rabbi Yehoshua. He said to him, have we made any difference between a priest who is a chaver and a priest who is an am haaretz? In other words, this halacha, that if a priest testifies that this animal became blemished, we don't trust him independently, does that only apply to kohanim who are not part of the initiated rabbinic community? Or does it apply even to a Kohen like me? I'm not an Am Haaretz, I'm what's called a Chaver. A Chaver is, in, in Talmudic parlance, is a member of the initiated rabbinic community. So am I ex exempt from this law, that if I don't have independent corroboration, I'm not entitled to the animal, or does that apply to me as well? So, so um, Rabbi Yehoshua replied, yes. There is a difference, and therefore you get, you'll get still get to keep the animal. He, there, he thereupon came before him, Gamliel. He said to him, have we made any difference between a priest who is a chaver and a priest who is an am haaretz? So Rabbi Tzadok was not satisfied. He was, still, he was fearful that he shouldn't maybe make a mistake, and so he asked the second Shiloh. And as we know, if the first rabbi says it's kosher, don't go to the second rabbi and ask if it's kosher because you're, at, you're, you're creating, you're asking for disaster. If the rabbi says the cinnamon buns are kosher, <laughs> don't dray a cup on social media. Just, you want to eat them? Eat them. You don't want to eat them? Don't eat them. So, but Rabbi Yoshua was not satisfied. And, uh, sorry, Reb Tzadok was not satisfied, so he asked Rabbi Gamliel in addition. And he said to him, have we made any difference between a priest who is a chaver and a priest who is an am haaretz? Rabbi Gamliel replied, no, there is no difference. And therefore, you're, if you don't have independent corroboration that the animal was blemished on its own, then you cannot have the animal. So Reb Tzadok said to him, but Rabbi Yoshua told me yes. <laughs> He said, wait until the great debaters enter the Beis HaMedrash. When they entered the Beis HaMedrash, the questioner arose and asked, have we made any difference between a priest who is a chaver and one who is an am haaretz? Rabbi Yoshua said, no, there's no difference. Now, Rabbi Yoshua had just previously said yes. So what's going on? He figures up, oh, he's being, he's, this is public now, so he's got to be a little bit different. Thereupon, Rabbi Gamliel said, was not the answer yes reported to me in your name? Yehoshua, stand on your feet and let them testify against you. Rabbi Yehoshua stood up on his feet and said, how shall I act? If indeed I were alive and he were dead, the living can contradict the dead. But since both he and I are alive, how can the living contradict the living? So basically, Rabbi Yehoshua said, I'm not going to contradict Rabbi Tzadok. If he said that I said that he's allowed to have the animal, I can't tell him now that I'm going to contradict him. So basically, I've been caught. I have no response. Rabbi Gamliel was upset at Rabbi Yehoshua, 
And Rabbi Gamliel was sitting and discoursing while Rabbi Yehoshua stood on his feet until all the people murmured and said to Chutzpah, the Maturgaman, the interpreter, silence, and he was silent. Now this story may sound somewhat familiar to you. This is the precursor to the very famous story about how Rabbi Gamliel was deposed from his seat as the Nasi, as the leader of the Jewish people. Because this was one out of three episodes where he showed public disrespect to Rabbi Yehoshua, who was the senior rabbi at the time, but was not the Nasi, was not the political leader. And as a result, because of this story and two other stories that happened similar to it, Rabbi Gamliel was removed as the Nasi. And who took over for Rabbi Gamliel? Anyone know? Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. He looked like a 70-year-old man. God made a miracle so that he would have a long white beard, even though he was only 18 years old. Okay? So that's all of these stories are related. But what's, what's interesting is that this story about a Kohen not being allowed to use an animal that develops a blemish that could have been man-inflicted is related to the downfall of both Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yehoshua in some way. It's an interesting aside. We'll see if there's any connection to this as well. Now, there is also something that's less than flattering about the Kohanim that we're going to read about in this week's Haftorah. The Haftorah for Shabbos Hanukkah is from the book of Zechariah. And it, we are shown a vision of Zechariah of Yehoshua Kohen Gadol. <coughs> Yehoshua, the high priest, who was at the very cusp of the beginning of the second temple. There's a machlokis as to whether he actually served in the second temple or was only in the Babylonian exile. Different opinions about that. But the Torah describes the vision that Zechariah has of Yehoshua, the high priest, is standing in front of the angel of God. And, and the, in Pasa Gimel of that Haftorah, it says, the Yehoshua haya Lavush begadim tsoim ve'omed lifnei hamalach. That Yehoshua the high priest was wearing dirty clothes, standing before the angel. The Talmud has one account of Rabbi Yehoshua's dirty clothes and says it has to do with, the, with his own children who, were, who did not act correctly. But the Abarbanel tells us that, and Zechariah then has an image of a, of a menorah in his dream, that is being lit by the Kohen Gadol. And that's its connection to the whole Hanukkah story because Yehoshua Kohen Gadol is sort of the uh, ancestor of all future Kohanim Gedolim who are going to serve in the temple. Take a look at the Abarbanel, and he says as follows, O Zachar Hanavi, Shera'at Yehoshua Lavush Begadim Tsoim, Velo Amarze al Yehoshua Atzmo, Kinafsho HaTehora Lo Naga'a B'Dvar Tum'ah. <coughs> that this vision of Yehoshua having dirty clothes is not casting aspersions on Yehoshua himself, the, the high priest, but rather, aval, because he himself was completely holy and pure. Aval ra'a zera Yehoshua vehem habanim asher yatsu'u v'nim shechu achar kach mibnei chashmonai. But what he did see was the descendants of Yehoshua, who would eventually emerge as the Hasmonean dynasty, and it refers to the Hasmoneans, who were both the Kohanim Gedolim and the monarchy. So this was the only time in Jewish history that I'm aware of, except maybe for Moshe, where the monarchy and the Kahuna Gedola were blended into the same people, which is a very, very dangerous toxic combination. Because as we know, uh, whenever you mix politics and religion, well, that's, that's not a discussion for now. But anyway, this was, the, uh, this, was the, this was what he saw as far as the dirty clothes was the Hasmoneans. He says, the the Hasmoneans wearing dirty clothes is the dirty clothes of rulership, which Hashem was not happy that they had taken. The clean clothes of the Kohanim, they are clean when they are serving in the temple as the Kohanim. 
אמנם בגדי הסררות והמלכות ובגדי um, נקם ושפיכות דמים שלקחו להם, היו בלי ספק בערכם בגדים סועים. But the clothing of vengeance and bloodshed of the Hasmoneans and all of the, the, um, the bloodshed that they caused after the Hanukkah story, which you can read about in Josephus, was there's no question that that's the reference to dirty clothes that are being mentioned in this Haftor, in this vision that Zechariah has of Yehoshua Kohen Gadol. So there's this aspect of the kahuna that is less than flattering. Number one, in the Kohanim in general in the Second Temple period, that there's a certain suspicion against them. And there's also this idea that when they took this power for themselves, they became corrupted in some way, and this was the dirty clothing. The Rambam also writes in the laws of Shemitah, which is totally unrelated to special status assigned to the Kohanim. And this is really where we're going to get to something quite interesting. You might argue that it's reasonable for even a good person to be suspect of not wanting to have, to, to sh to have a whole day wasted to schlep to Yerushalayim to bring a carbon when he could easily keep the animal for himself if just there's like a little, you know, whoops, you know, and the animal gets, uh, gets farshtukt, you know? <laughs> you know, so that's, uh, that's understandable. It's understandable, right? However, this extends beyond. In the laws of Shemitah, which has nothing, there's no special status to the Kohanim for Shemitah, right? Are we all, we all aware of that? Shemitah produce is forbidden at a certain time of the year. When, once the produce is no longer available, if anyone has stockpiled Shemitah produce, that produce is forbidden to Israelites, to Kohanim, to everybody. So take a look at a very interesting law from the Rambam. HaKohanim chashudim al hashvi'it. Kohanim are suspect of marketing Shemitah produce and uh, peddling sh forbidden Shemitah produce. Why? Lefi shehem omrim. Because they say to themselves, Ho'il v'hatrumot mutarot lanu, Afal pi shehen asurin al hazarim v'mita. He says, you know, truma is a holy tithe that only Kohanim can eat. For an Israelite, it's not kosher. If an Israelite eats truma, which is the tithe, the produce tithe that is presented to the Kohen, an Israelite who eats truma is punished with heavenly death. Mita bide shamayim. Kal v'chomer perot shviit. So if that's the case, then certainly Shemitah produce, where the penalty of eating Shemitah produce is not as harsh as the penalty for eating truma, well, if Israelites cannot eat truma but Kohanim can, then certainly Shemitah produce is only forbidden for Israelites, but we're Kohanim, we're exceptional. And therefore, there is an argument to be made that a Kohen might harbor Shemitah produce for himself and say, you know, yeah, I know it's Usr, but Usr only applies to you, it doesn't apply to me, because I'm special. Lefichach, sa'a truma shenafla lemea sa'a shel perot shevi'i ta'ale. So therefore, if you have one measure of truma, which falls into a hundred measures of Shemitah produce, so it is batel. We can say that it's nullified and it's all de deemed as Shemitah produce, and even an Israelite could eat it as long as Shemitah produce during this, this time is, for, is permissible. But nafla lepachot mimea yirkavu hakol, velo yimachru lo kohanim kechol meduma lefi shem chashudim al hashviit. But if less than one in a hundred of truma and Shemitah gets mixed, you can't give it to a Kohen, because we're suspicious that the Kohen may keep it past its expiration date when Shemitah when produce is no longer permitted. So this is a very, very serious accusation against Kohanim in general. Kohanim feel a sense of entitlement. They feel that sense of, I'm different, I'm special. Now, is that a good trait? This idea of exceptionalism. You know, that's what's being debated in the United States today. 
this whole, um, you know, the, the, the French philosopher Tocqueville had a, a whole essay on the exceptionalism of the United States. And this has made people who are on the liberal side of politics extremely uncomfortable. If you remember during the Obama era, this was one of the issues where Obama was de-emphasizing the exceptionalism of America and wanted to focus on the global community. Do you remember that whole debate? And then now comes along Trump and he's, you know, make America great again because he believes in the exceptionalism has to be emphasized. And there's obviously pros and cons about the emphasis on exceptionalism, on saying I'm special, I'm different. So let's look at this very interesting essay, which originates from the Shem Yishmol, but it's in a sefer called Na'ot Desha, which has all of the Torah of the Sachet Shav dynasty. It's a very, very interesting uh, essay. We're just going to see a little part of it for now. He starts off the essay by saying that when you think about it, what allowed the Greeks to be so haughty as to think that they could defeat the Jews. They knew Jewish history. They knew that Paro was defeated, Bilam was defeated, Haman was defeated, the Persians, right? What made the Greeks think that they could overpower the Jews after, after having learned about that anyone who tried to mess with the Jews was, over, was overpowered? And his conclusion is, is that the thing that made the Greeks think that they could do it was because they thought we're special, we're different. And that's, you know, Hitler also thought, Yamach Shemo thought the same thing as well. We're better than all of the people who came before us. We are the, the, uh, the apex of humanity. And all who came before us and tried to defeat the Jews didn't know what they were doing. We're going to be able to overpower the Jews. And then he writes, Ach kol mida ra'a ba'asher hi bichlal b'riyato shel olam i efshu shetihiye ra'a ad ha-tachlit. Any negative quality, if it exists in this world, it means that God created it. And therefore, there has to be some redeeming quality in even bad qualities. And therefore, shlo tuchal li'staif mimena gam tova b'sod mi'itein tohor mitamei lo echad. As scripture writes, that sometimes even from the most impure source, you can get something pure. And therefore, even this whole concept of brazenness and, and, and haughtiness and ex sense of exceptionalism that arose within Greece could certainly be converted into something positive. He says, what was it that made the Hasmoneans think that they could rise up and stand up against the mighty Greek army, the mightiest army of its time? Do you think it would be possible? for such a small ragtag group of untrained uh, soldiers to rise up against the mightiest army in the world. It says the answer is, the Greeks who were the kings of chutzpah, right, that was what they were known for, their sort of their their sense of audaciousness that we can do anything, that was the prevailing zeitgeist within the world at that time. That was in the air, and it spread to the Jewish community as well. If they're exceptional, we can also be exceptional. We can do something that no one else can do. And therefore, that's what gave them the inspiration to say, even though we're weaker, we can take them on. We can do it. So all the Hasmoneans were doing was taking that air of confidence and audaciousness and incorporating it into, into a holy endeavor. 
Likro milchemet hadat, to wage a holy war. Chalashim neged giborim umaatim neged merubim, to fight against a much more formidable enemy, so that even though they were weaker and smaller, they could, they could be victorious. So therefore, this is an example of how a negative quality of chutzpah and arrogance and I can do anything was able to be converted into something holy. And that's really the story of what Hanukkah represents on a deeper level. And that is how something unholy was incorporated into holiness. Because it was being used for that purpose. And therefore the miracle of our victory over the Greeks is different from all other miracles that occurred to the Jewish people heretofore. Shehem hayu bigvul hakedusha levad, because all previous miracles occurred for the Jewish people when we were behaving in a holy manner. Aval neis ze hayahit pashtut hakedusha af bigvul hachitzonim. But this was a miracle that took place when we behaved in a manner which, was norm, which would normally be unholy, and we were able to envelop it within holiness. So the idea of Hanukkah is to be able to take that which is really outside of the holy purview and envelop it within holiness, to be able to take holiness and expand it and envelop that which is normally unholy. And that's the reason And that's precisely why the whole institution of lighting the menorah is not to light it for ourselves, but to shine the light into the darkness. Because that's the idea of taking the unholy and enveloping it within the circle of holiness. What's the unholy part? This, this chutzpah, to have that sense of audacity, to rise up against someone who, by all measures, you should not be able to fight against. That's That sense of uh, I can do anything, right? Even when a person of, of, of regular discretion would realize that this is a losing battle, to have that kind of brazenness and say, I'm going to be different, I'm exceptional, right? They were able to take that quality, which is normally a negative, and turn it into a positive. Now, let me, let me just, let, let's, let's just uh, try to finish the essay. Um, this is to illustrate that not only is darkness removed from holy places, but to say that we can convert the darkness outside of us into light, we can take even negative traits and turn them into positives. And that's why this mitzvah is not only extant within Eretz Yisrael, where the miracle happened, but it applies in Chutz La'aretz and Golos as well. Now, I'm not, we're not going to have time to do the whole thing, but let's just jump to the last paragraph. Umi dvarim, from all of that which we mentioned, Shebimei Chanukah b'yocholet adam laharhiv oz benafsho lageshet el hakodesh, that Chanukah is a time where a human being can accumulate a sense of confidence, to feel that sense of exceptionalism and I'm different and I'm special, and we can turn that into a holy trait. That even though normally I feel the normal sense of humility, that I'm not really, I shouldn't try to um, overstep my capabilities. But Hanukkah is a time when you're supposed to put aside all sense of humility. Hanukkah is a time when you're supposed to say, I am special, I am different, I can do things that no one else can do. That's the message of Hanukkah, that's sort of what's supposed to be happening. And therefore, if you can apply that to spiritual growth and say, you know what, I'm not going to be happy with the way that everyone else is practicing their Judaism. I know that I can be different. 
because I see that I'm not going to be happy with the status quo. I'm not going to be happy with the way everyone else is davening or the way everyone else is having Shabbos or the way everyone else is doing things because I know that we've allowed ourselves to atrophy and become less than stellar and I'm going to be different. If you can apply that exceptional quality, that quality of exceptionalism, that's what Hanukkah, that's the koach of Hanukkah to allow us to do that. Hashem yisborach nita bilvavenu ahavat tarav yirat shamayim amen and may God implant that inspiration within us for the love of Torah and for the fear of heaven. So the idea being is that exceptionalism is a double-edged sword. When we talk about the Kohanim, the Kohanim are people who feel that we are different and the rules don't apply to us. And that can be very, very dangerous. You see how dangerous it is because even when it comes to Shemitah, which has nothing to do with the Kohuna, the Kohanim still feel I'm special, I'm different. And that was the illustration from the, from the Rambam. But this whole idea, what made Reb Tzadok the most, the, right, the most righteous sage of his time to even feel that he, could, that he could question? It was his sense of exceptionalism. But at the same time, that sense of exceptionalism made him want to question further and further. And perhaps that was, even though his intentions were good, perhaps that sense of needing to know that it's not enough for me I'm different, I'm a Kohen. It's not enough for me just to ask the first rabbi who gives me a heter, is it okay? He had to go and ask a second rabbi. And disaster was met, was met with disaster. But the exceptionalism of the Kohanim is what also led to their ultimate demise in the Hasmonean dynasty. Because that idea that I, the rules don't apply to me could be used in a very, very dangerous way. But you take these eight days of Hanukkah and you say, I'm different. I'm exceptional. I'm not like the rest of my community. There's something special within me. I don't know. I have to find out what it is. I'm going to define it and make sure I cultivate it. That's what these days are devoted to. We, we take something that would normally be viewed as a negative and turn that into a positive. Okay, final questions, comments? Yes. Sorry. Um, so this is taking something from a negative negative tendency of exceptionalism and entitlement and turning it into a, a, something positive, but wouldn't it be a, like a much preferred way to just have a Yerushalayim and do things like you said with the Kohanim with the Shlep to have to go um, to the base and they thought it was a Shlep, but of course it would be much more much better if they if, if you have the, the Shem Shemayim attitude, then every little bit of the Shlep would have been a Kedusha Malacha for them. And something inside me tells me that Kohanim, it was a whole week work. It wasn't like Shlepping to go to Macy's. Of course, of course it's a holy work, but come on, everyone, let's, let's not be... There was no train back then. Let's not, let, let, let's not be uh, overly idea, let's not overly idealize. The Kohanim, they were human beings just like you and me. And if your life could have been alleviated, you wouldn't have to spend the whole day schlepping to Yerushalayim and going up to the temple. And all you had to do was sort of like ac accidentally bump into your, the sheep next to you to let it uh, scrape itself against the wall. I don't know how, how many of us would not succumb to that temptation. But all the stuff they did in the base of Mikdash, it could have been interpreted as tedious. Mm -hmm. Um, That's and right. Did it and That's did. the mushal they always give us women when it comes to laundry and when it comes to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like the Quran yeah. had to do oh, teach us all that oh, housekeeping in the base of mikdash and that was a big mitzvah and all the housework you do is also a big mitzvah. That's, that's we're why we're relating to it like that. That's what they. That's yes. the analogy. A lot of people. Okay, yeah, well, I know, I, I, I know. All right, that's great. I mean, okay. I have, I, I, I have nothing to say to that. <laughs> okay. I have a comment. Um, actually, I'm going to quote my late mother, Alava Um <clears throat> My parents got out of Europe uh, when they were children. Okay, so we have a lot of family who are survivors of the camps or Siberia or all kinds of situations. And my mother... Uh, spoke about some of them who became like huge successes in terms of frankly earning a living, making 
starting difficult times in the United States, let's say, and then doing well. And she said, they have nothing to lose. And so they had something in them, a spark, whereas they didn't just sort of lie down and say, that's it, you know, I suffered, it's over. They had nothing to lose, so they, like, sort of the Maccabees really had nothing to lose. It's a little bit of a different right. interpretation. The, well, the, 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 those who survived the Shoah came out, came out with pennies in their pockets. Right. And they, they also, they, they felt that, listen, if I've survived so miraculously, exactly. you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was that sense so of exceptionalism. Words, it and it turned, it turned out into a tremendously positive thing. Yeah. Jewish communities to this day yeah, are the beneficiaries of that kind of chutzpah right. that our grandparents had coming out of the war. Yes, so you're absolutely nice right. Time. You're absolutely right. Also, the, um, weren't they, um, one other thing. So it's sort of like the state of Israel, tiny little state. Yeah. Like the survivors who 100%. went. One hundred percent. Medinat Israel was founded on that same type of chutzpah ethic. They had nothing to yeah. lose. Yeah. One hundred percent so right. Sort of Absolutely. Okay. Just a couple more. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if um, they used uh, sort of used the basket made of willow, peeled willow twigs, like twigs. Do they normally cut the mouth of animals, or they did? Like in that's the, a very good question. A, uh, yeah. So you it's, know, it's a good question. I, it probably was a common basket that was used by poor people because he was not a wealthy man. So I don't think he can be faulted for having used that type of but basket. Is it known that those baskets might cut? That's a good question. I don't know. Smooth, it's made yeah, I hear you. I hear yeah. you. Yes, okay. Linda. Sorry, I just look at this two different ways, like Sarah, I'm responding to you. So I think that when I look at it, when I first read it, I'm thinking, well, there obviously was corruption at some point. There must have been some corruption there at some point from somebody, otherwise this point wouldn't have been brought up. Or there wasn't any corruption, and it's sort of like, why do you say, like, you're not allowed to touch something on Shabbat because it's trying to prevent it before it happens. So, like, if you, you immunize kids because you don't wait till the disease is there and then immunize me, immunize me first, so, maybe all these rules for the Kohanim were just there on the far off chance that maybe, maybe, maybe don't tempt them and prevent it before it ever happens. Okay. It doesn't mean because that they weren't holy. And susceptible to being human. That's right. Yeah. Okay, happy Hanukkah, everyone. Yeah.